I see raising hands, unless I go out of my way. So we'll start in about 40 seconds. That's okay with you? That's fine. Okay, well, hello everybody. Welcome to this session of the Western Hemisphere Colloquium on Geometry and Physics. Uh, we are fortunate to have Nati Seiberg, who will talk about comments on lattice versus continuum quantum field theory. If you have any questions, just uh, raise your hand, don't interrupt. Hopefully that won't get too far out of hand. Go ahead, Nati. Thank you. Before I thank you for inviting me, so first I'll thank you for inviting me to speak here, but much more important, I would like to thank you all for organizing this absolutely fantastic lecture series, which helped us to some extent say, stay sane during the pandemic period and kept us connected. And at some point or another, we'll, this pandemic will probably be over but I would encourage you to continue this effort because I think this is something that is definitely worthwhile. It will be one of the few good things that came out of the pandemic. So with that in mind, I'm going to start with a general introduction and different segments of the talk are aimed for different segments of the community. And this is a rather broad community. So the, this talk will have many segments. And I'll give some general comments and general discussion, philosophy general about what's important in physics in my view and so forth. But the more technical things I'll be talking about are in two recent papers with my absolutely fantastic students, uh, Gorantla and Lam. Lam is no longer a student. He's a postdoc now at MIT. And my absolutely fantastic postdoc, Shu Heng Shao, who is also no longer a postdoc, but assistant professor at Stony Brook. So the theme of this talk will be the interplay between lattice and continuum quantum field theory. And this interplay is kind of a two-way street. And as you will see, there are challenges and obstacles in both ways of this uh, street. So first, you all know that quantum field theory is enormously successful in physics different branches of physics, and in mathematics, it has produced many new results. And I don't think I'll have to convince you very much that it's not mathematically rigorous. In fact, you have already complained about it before I started the talk today. So how are we going to make quantum field theory rigorous? And there isn't a unique way to do that, and, but the best way known so far, which is not perfect, but the best way is to regularize space on the lattice. So this is either space or space time. We triangulate it and we put the degrees of freedom on the sides or links or plaquettes or cubes of the lattice. So we can do something more sophisticated. Now the functional integral is well defined because we have a finite functional integral is a finite dimensional integral over the degrees of freedom on the lattice. And the challenge, one challenge here is to go to the continuum limit. So we introduce a lattice space in A, and we take A to zero and the number of sites to infinity, we make this mesh denser and denser. We keep all the distances fixed and we take the limit, and we would like to show that this limit exists. This is very much like defining an integral as a Riemann sum or studying geometry or topology, but triangulating the manifold, but then we have to prove that the answer are independent of all the details of how we set it up. Now, this is one reason to be interested in the lattice theory is a way of defining what we mean by the continuum functional integral of a continuum quantum field theory. In condensed matter physics, the issue is exactly the opposite. There, the lattice does exist. We don't need to invent a lattice. The problem is defined on the lattice. Here is an example of a crystal with atoms and they interact with each other or in the 
magnetic charge, magnetic moments interact and charges and there are electrons and so forth. And the goal in condensed matter physics is to find the long distance behavior of the system. What phase is it in? Is it a conductor or a superconductor? Or how does it react to pressure? How, whether it conduct heat or not? What happens when it with magnetic field and so forth? And the lore that all of us have been educated by, and maybe I would even say brainwashed, is that whatever happens at short distances, at long distances can be captured by a continuum quantum field. The fact that the short distances we have a lot is, this doesn't matter. If you look at the desk around you or whatever you have around you, you don't see any remnant of the underlying lattice. It looks like a continuous material. And therefore we expect that as we take the lattice space into zero, or as we look at it with poor resolution or at long distances, the lattice is gone and we describe everything in terms of a continuum field. So again, this is a two-way street, the short distances. So in one approach, we have a continuum theory and we use the lattice in order to define it. In the other approach, the problem is formulated on the lattice and the goal is to find the corresponding continuum field. And both questions, both directions are interesting and both of them are challenging. In one direction, we ask ourselves, if we try to define the continuum theory using the lattice, does the limit exist? I've already mentioned that. Maybe the limit doesn't exist. Maybe if we triangulate space, not with squares, but with triangles, we're going to get a different answer. Maybe what we write on the lattice is a little bit different. The continuum answer will be different. So this is something that needs to be proven. The second challenge, and if this is true, is does the some quantities in quantum field theory depend on the topology of, of field space. For example, we have maps from space time to a target space. And if the target space is say a circle, we can discuss why and how many times does the map from space to space time to the target space, which is a circle, how many times does it wind around? This depends on the fields being continuous. If we define the fields only on the lattice, we cannot make sense of the question how many times do we wind around because there's no winding in the map from a circle, from lattice to a circle. And there are many other related questions that depend on the, on the topology of field space, anomalies and so forth. And we'll discuss it in a lot of details soon. So this is another challenge of using the lattice and many continuum quantum field theories do not like the lattice primarily for this reason that it cannot capture many quantities, many features that are known to be important. Also, some quantum field theories do not admit suitable Euclidean lattice action. So for example, if we have self-dual gauge fields, if little forms, or we have fermions, we can't put them on a lattice in any sensible way, maybe suitable. There are various ways around it, but none of them is perfect. And finally, there are some quantum field theories that do not even have a Lagrangian, let alone a lattice version of the Lagrangian, the two zero theory is an example. So if you think that the lattice is going to be a magic bullet, it solves all the problems of defining quantum field theory, the answer is no. Even if you address this question, you will still have to address all these questions. Even if the limit exists, this will not be a solution to all problems. Yet it's still something that is worth exploring. There are also challenges in the opposite direction. So I told you about this lore that we start in condensed matter physics, we start from some lattice problem at short distances, and our goal is to find the long distance continuum field theory for it. And until recently, I was quite convinced that this is always the case. But some exotic models were found recently. These are exotic lattice models. One of them, the XY plaquette model, I will discuss in detail soon. Other models are fractal models, starting with these people and a lot of follow-up, and they do not have a standard continuum limit. So the lattice model exists, but it's quite clear that its low energy effective description is not captured by a standard continuum quantum field. So here the question, and this is the main, my, was my main interest in this, in this topic, is that we have a system, it definitely exists by all the rules. It should be captured by a low energy continuum quantum field theory, but it's not. And then how do we fit it 
into the framework of continuum quantum filter. Even though the framework of continuum quantum filter is not completely well defined, even though, though there are gaps in our understanding, something will have to give. And is there an extension of what we normally do in continuum quantum field that can accommodate these peculiar systems? So mathematician might say, we can't even define the simple case. Why do we go into the generalization of it? But maybe the generalization will actually teach us the right way to think about it. Who knows? It's definitely worth exploring. So what do we know about these, field, about these systems? First of all, they're characterized by a subsystem global symmetry. I'll define it more carefully below. These are symmetries that act not of all of space, but on subspaces of space. So normally when we have a symmetry, we have an operator that acts on all of space and say rotates all the fields or shifts all the fields and do something like this. Here, the global symmetry acts on the subspace, co-dimension one or co-dimension two subspace of space, and acts only on the fields there. So we have a separate group element with different subspaces. This is true on the lattice, and we would like to see how it happens in different fields. As a result of that, some observables vary on the, lattice, on the scale of the lattice space. So if we compute it at one lattice space and then we move to the next side of the lattice, the observables are completely different. Translating it to continuum language, it means that the observables are going to be discontinuous as we vary the coordinates in space or coordinates in space time. So we're going to vary the, the, the correct answers. If you just solve the lattice problem and blindly take the continuum limit, the correlation functions are going to be discontinuous or even singular functions or as we vary the positions in space. That might sound sick, but it is what it is. That's what, that's, this is the correct answer. And our goal is to try and describe it. Some of the models exhibit the ground state degeneracy, which is infinite on the ground state. So in topological, these are gapped systems. In topological field theories, one of the interesting quantities is it's what's the number of ground states for a given spatial topology. And there's usually a formula for the number of ground states, spaces of torus or a double torus or some sphere or whatever. Here, this NAM answer is finite on the lattice, but it becomes infinite in a very peculiar way as we take the continuum loop. So as the number of sites goes to infinity, the number of ground states, the number of sites of the lattice goes to infinity, the number of ground states diverges in an exponential way in the size of the system, which looks very sick, but again, it is what it is. The common thing to all these features is what I like to think about is UV-IR mix. UV is short distance, IR is long distance. And what we see here is that long distance phenomena are very sensitive to details at short distances. This is exactly what we have in mind when we think that the long distance, okay, when we think that the long distance physics is captured by an effective field theory or an effective theory, we, what we really have in mind is that this thing cannot happen. There's a description of what happens at long distances, which is independent of the details at short distances. And we can change something small at short distances. It makes no difference for the long distance behavior. This is not the case in this system. And I emphasize that similar things were seen earlier, mixing between UV and IR in certain string constructions, which are considered enigmatic. Field theories are non-commutative spaces, little string theory, and so forth. So this is as far as introduction of why we are doing it. It's a very challenging problem, and maybe it's totally misguided. Maybe this system should not be fit into the framework of quantum field theory, but I think this is something that we should, that is worth trying. So Shu and Shao and I wanted to write some kind of an extension of standard quantum field theory that captures that. And we went on a limb, very thin ice, and we wrote something motivated by the lattice model. So this thing was designed so that it so, so that it describes what the lattice answers give us. And we wrote a system that has some space-time symmetries, but no Lorentz invariance and no rotation symmetry. This is not something to be too excited about. This is completely standard. It's easy to write continuum field theories that are not rotation and we impose this exotic global symmetry that I mentioned earlier, 
and we gauge them. If you have a global symmetry, there's a clear procedure how to consider the corresponding gauge theory, and I will do that soon. So that's what we did. And what we found is that it is inevitable that in the space of fields and in the space of gauge parameters, we have to study, or we have to allow for certain discontinuous fields and discontinuous gauge parameters. That of course opens a Pandora box because once you lose continuity of the fields, then what are we really, what are we doing? We need to be a lot more precise. We should ask which discontinuities we allow, which are not, does this thing really make sense? And related the, to that is the question of what is known in physics as universality, which is really independent of most of the details of the, at the line of scale. Because if things start jumping around, then things could depend on all sorts of things that normally we don't worry about. And we'll have examples of this soon. So the obvious questions when we talk about this is does this really make sense? Can we make sense out of a field theory which has to include this, this funny behavior? And I want to emphasize that this whole discussion is really inevitable. If we start from these lattice systems, we are forced to consider these discontinuous fields. And once we consider discontinuous fields, we are forced to consider discontinuous gauge parameters. And once we do that, we are forced to address the question, does this make sense? So this whole line of reasoning is really inevitable. In order to address it, I would like to start with a much simpler example, which does not have most of these peculiarities, but I'm going to present it from a new view that will later be easier to address, to use in the more subtle systems. So now put these big deep questions aside and let's discuss a system where these subtleties do not arise. And I'll present it in a slightly modern way that we will later employ for the more subtle systems. And this is really the canonical field theory. If you take quantum field theory course, this is, arguably the first interesting example you study. And it comes under different names. First of all, we can do it in many number of dimensions. The simplest one and most interesting and most, most studied one is in one plus one dimensions. This is two Euclidean dimension or one plus one Lorentzian signature model. It comes under, originally came under the name of XY model. It also known as the C equals one conformal field theory known as the compact boson. And it has a number of names. And I think it's fair to say that there are tens of thousands of papers addressing this from all sorts of points of view, including math. And the construction of this theory is as rigorous as one would like. They have closed form expressions for all correlation functions on any surface. So there's nothing to argue about. So this is a good place to make sure that our tools work correctly. Let's, let's review this case. So we start with a lattice a two-dimensional lattice, I mean Euclidean space, and I have an action. The degrees of freedom are phases on the sites, on every site there's a separate phase. And we compute delta mu, this is the lattice derivative, so this is the difference between phi here and phi here. We take the cosine so that it's independent of shifting in any of the phi's by two pi. And we sum that over all the links. And this is the action, the Euclidean action, and then we write e to the minus the action, and we integrate over all possible phi's. Since we have a finite number of sites, so we are space is a torus, so we have periodic boundary conditions. We have a num finite number of sites, we have a finite dimension that they will perform. So this lattice system is completely rigorous. We have a finite dimensional integral, and we'll soon study it in various ways. The main point of this system is it has a global U1 symmetry. We can shift all the phi's on, on every site by a parameter alpha. So we shift every, at every point, we shift phi by alpha, an arbitrary num real number. And since it's independent of space and time, this is a symmetry of the action. The symmetry is U1 because phi is circle valued, so alpha is circle valued. Then we make beta large. When beta is large, all the configurations where the cosine, it, when the argument of the cosine is not near zero are exponentially suppressed. So we can imagine that phi is slowly varying on the lattice and we can expand it in the power series and we find the corresponding continuum Lagrangian. So we have an integral over space time, d mu phi square, 
and I drop the local world constant, it does, that does not matter. And this is the continuum action. This action has been studied, was really beaten to death. It's known as the C equals one compact boson. It's free. That's why it is solvable free, which means that the action is quadratic in phi. And it has two global symmetries. And for every global symmetry, there is a delta current, which is conserved. This is some of the mu. I don't pay attention to upper and lower indices. I mean, flat to Euclidean space, so this makes no difference. So we have a netter current, which is conserved. I use the string theory terminology. So we have a momentum symmetry and winding symmetry. The momentum symmetry is this one, and it is conserved, i.e. it satisfies this differential equation because this is the equation of motion of phi coming from this action. So this is one conserved current. There's another conserved current, which this one, which is conserved, so if you have it with d mu, the derivatives commute, and therefore it satisfies the conservation equation. So two comments, this symmetry, the momentum symmetry, is the continuum version of the U1 symmetry I mentioned earlier that shifts all the phi by a constant. This new symmetry is called emergent. It's emergent because it does not exist on the lattice. It depends on phi big continuums, and it measures how many times the field phi winds as we wind around space. So if we wind around space, space is a circle. Phi is a map from space, which is a circle, to the target space, which is a circle. And it is characterized by a winding number. The dense matter is called vorticity. And in the continuum, we have this, this conserved curve. So we have two U1s. And there's a more advanced comment that these two U1s have a mixed truth anomaly between them. I'll mention it a little bit. Paper. On the lattice, we cannot discuss it because this symmetry exists on the lattice and this one does not. And therefore, there's no question about the Atuft anomaly between the two symmetries because one of them is not there. Another property of this action is that it has exact self duality. So, if we consider the theory based on beta and the theory based on one over beta, some two pi's, then the two theories are the same. This comes under the name of T duality. And as we perform this, Duality, it exchanges this current and that current, and therefore it exchanges the momentum symmetry with the winding symmetry. And since the winding symmetry does not exist on, on the lattice and the momentum symmetry does exist on the lattice, it's clear that this self-duality cannot exist on the lattice. So this is all very well known, and I'm sure all of you know that very well. I'm going to assume that you all know that very well. And therefore I'm going to raise the question, how much of this continuum discussion can be present on the lattice? Because after all, the theme of this talk is that we go back and forth between the lattice and the continuum. How much of that can exist on the lattice? So here we're going to make, change the problem a little bit and we're going to just tell you kind of a spoiler. We're going to present a lattice model, completely finite number of degrees of freedom, which exhibits all these features which are very, very uh, continuum-like. So we start with the lattice, and instead of writing the action as a cosine, we write it in what is known as a Villain form. This was invented by Villain in the 70s. So we still have a lattice. We have real value degree of freedom on every side, phi. So phi is now not circle value, but it's real. And we have a Z gauge field on the lattice, which effectively makes phi circle value. The way we do that, is that we on every on every link we write delta mu of phi, which is phi here minus phi here, and we subtract an integer on that link n mu, and we write this action. So this action is very similar to the previous one. It has a gauge symmetry. I can shift every phi by an arbitrary into two pi times an integer, where this m depends on which side I'm on. So I can separately shift each phi by two pi times an integer. And that's a symmetry of the action if I combine that with a gauge transformation on n mu, shifting it by the delta mu n. So this action has the same, effectively the same field space as the original action, and, but it has some advantages because it's free. The action is quadratic. And indeed, if you study the correlation functions in this action, with this action, you find answers which are very similar to those of the action with the cosine. So this action is, leads to an almost identical answers 
uh, the problem with the cosine. And for large beta, they are actually numerically exactly the same. So this is another action that we can study. So we slightly change the problem. But now we realize that we can add another term to the action, which is gauge invariant. So everything has to be gauge invariant. So we add this term to the action. So this is an integer valued gauge field, the gauge field, gauge theory Z on the lattice. And it has a curvature. This is the curvature of this Z gauge field. We can have curvature because we are on the lattice in the continuum, we don't have any curvature for the Z gauge theory. But on the lattice, we can. This is the curvature on the lattice. This is the n here minus the n here plus the n here minus the n here. This is the curvature. And we square it. This is gauge invariant. You can check that this is gauge invariant under that. And we put a coefficient kappa. And now we are going to send kappa to infinity. If we send kappa to infinity, the local curvature of this Z gauge field is going to vanish because every configuration where on the plaquette we have something non-zero here. If it's non-zero and kappa is large, it suppresses this configuration. So all the configurations in the functional interval where the action is, a, when the curvature is not zero are going to be suppressed. So what I will basically do is study this action and I'm going to sum not of on arbit with arbitrary n mu's, but only on those n mu for which the curvature vanishes also on the lattice. And there is a simple trick to do that. But we send kappa to infinity and therefore the gauge field will be flat. So this is the same property we would like with the Z gauge field in the continuum. And now we'll do that with a trick. Instead of having this term with a parameter kappa that goes to infinity, I'm going to replace it by putting a field phi tilde on every plaquette and it's going to act as a Lagrange multiplier setting this thing to zero. So now I'm going to sum over all possible integer n's, all possible real values phi, and all possible circle values phi tilde. Phi tilde lives on the plaquettes. And if I look at this action, then if I first do the integral over phi tilde, it forces this thing to be zero. And if this thing is zero, I'm summing over all configurations of the n action such that the z gauge field is flat. But I can study this action without doing the integral over pi tilde. It turns out that this lattice action is very similar to the continuum two. First of all, it's free because it's quadratic in the fields. So we have this is real, this is real, and the ends are integers. Second, it has two global symmetries. We can shift phi by a constant. This is the same U1 symmetry that we had before. And it has this net current of the lattice. It also has another U1 symmetry because I can shift phi tilde by a constant. If I shift phi tilde by a constant, the action, which we'll refer to as a modified TN because we added this term, if I shift phi tilde by a constant, the Lagrangian density, which is this thing is not invariant, but it changes by a total derivative, which integrates to zero, or more precisely sums to zero. So this lattice action is both the momentum and the winding symmetry. And if you're a little bit more sophisticated, you can see, and if I'm asked, I'll be happy to explain that, that these two symmetries have a tooth anomaly already on the lattice. So notice this is space-time has a finite number of points. It's a finite dimensional interval, space, the functional interval, the functional dimensional interval. It has both the momentum symmetry and the winding symmetry with the tooth anomaly. Already this contradicts something that I alluded to earlier. I said winding symmetries assumes that the fields are continuous, how are we going to have winding symmetry on the lattice where space time is a lot, a number of finite points? How can we have a, a winding symmetry? And the answer is that this trick with the Lagrange multiplier and the gauge fields allows us to hide, the, to find the winding symmetry without relying on continuity. And because of that, it's, it's a little bit more sophisticated we get this symmetry that can have an, an anomaly on the lattice. So when people say that the anomaly is there because the functional integral needs regularization, this is completely regularizing, right? It's completely finite. It doesn't even need to be regularizing it as an anomaly. Also on every link, we have an integer and the action is quadratic in the integers. So we can use Poisson resummation in the sum over the ends. I'm not going to do it here explicitly, but as you do it explicitly, if you do that, the field find phi tilde flip rolls and beta becomes one over beta. 
So this lattice action or this lattice model has the T duality of the continuum model. So all the peculiarities of the continuum model, T duality, winding and momentum, and tooth anomaly between them, all of them exist in this lattice model. So armed with this behavior, we can study now a new model, which is an exotic model. This lattice model was first introduced by Paramakanti, Balance, and Fisher many years ago, and there's a lot of follow-up on it, and it is in two plus one dimensions. It, not, it is not Lorentz invariant. So we will, they use the Hamiltonian formulation. We're going to use the Euclidean time formulation. So space-time is a three-dimensional lattice. And we distinguish between the time direction, more precisely the Euclidean time directions parameterized by an integer tau, and the space directions parameterized by integers x and y. And we put e to the i phi in every site. So in every site, we have a circle-valued field. And this is the lattice action. Notice that space and time are not the same. We have kind of double derivatives in space and single derivative in time. And we have a global U1 symmetry. We can shift phi by a constant, but now the constant can depend on x and separately on y. This is an exact symmetry on the lattice. This term is invariant because delta tau kills these things. And this term is invariant because this depends only on x and this depends only on y. So delta x, delta y kills these things also. So this is the global system symmetry of the system, and it is a subsystem symmetry. We act separately on all, we rotate separately all the phi's in this row without touching the phi's at this row, or all the phi's in this column without touching the phi's in the next column. And if we blindly take the continuum limit, so we expand, we assume that phi is smooth and we expand, et cetera, we end up with this two plus one dimensional action. So this is an action in two plus one dimensions. It's a free action. So it seems like there should be, there should be no obstacle to analyzing this system. This is a system that just as the compact, ordinary compact boson can be analyzed rigorously in the continuum, it looks like this should be analyzable rigorously in the continuum. Because you know, after all, we just have to do a Gaussian interval. So we can think, what is the functional integral? Well, it is some determinant of the differential operator d by d tau square plus dx dy square. So this should be straightforward. So the action is free, but the first thing that we see is that some discontinuous field configurations are not suppressed already in the continuum. Imagine phi depends only on x and tau. And it's smooth in tau, but it's discontinuous in x. It jumps as a function of x and it's smooth in tau. Then this term is finite because we differentiate only with respect to tau. And this term is finite because of the double derivative kills it. If we had d by dx phi square as an enormous theory, that would not be the case. But what we see here is that if we just think of the functional integral with this action, this continuous field configurations are not suppressed. We'll still see how we deal with this. The system has a subglobal, a subsystem global symmetry with the following network current. We have a current j tau and another current which we call jxy satisfying this differential equation. And there are two of them mirroring what we saw in the compact boson. We have a momentum symmetry. If we just substitute this in here and this in here, the equation of motion of phi tells us that this current is conserved. Similarly, we have another symmetry, which we can call winding using the same terminology as in the compact boson, where the time component of the current is this, and the xy component of the current is that. And if you substitute it in the differential equations, the derivatives commute and the equation is satisfied. And using continuum techniques, you can show that this subsystem symmetry here and the subsystem symmetry here have a mixed anomaly between them very much like in the one plus one dimensional compact boson. Furthermore, we have an exact T duality, which exchanges phi in mu and mu zero. It exchanges the term with special derivative with the term with time derivative, and it exchanges the momentum in winding symmetries. So this is very similar to what we saw in the one plus one dimensional compact boson, but this is a very different, very peculiar system. And it leads to many questions. How should we treat more precisely these 
quantum field theories with discontinuous fields. Normally, we say that we don't have to think about them because if the field is discontinuous, the action for the field is infinite, and therefore such configurations are suppressed. They are not present in the functional universe. We don't need to discuss them. This is not the case here. Here, as I showed, some discontinuous field configurations are not suppressed. The next question is how much of that depends on the continuum limit? After all, we started from a lattice system. Is it true? Is what I've, we found this winding symmetry that is new, the tooth anomaly, the T duality, is it true on the lattice or not? It's not true in the original lattice system that we started. So, does it really make sense? Can we make sense out of this continuum field theory? So, again, the logic is very much like what I showed for the one plus one dimensional compact boson. We start from a standard looking, almost standard looking lattice model, lattice model that was introduced earlier. We wrote a continuum action. We manipulated it blindly, not paying too much attention to all these subtleties. We found peculiar results. And now we ask ourselves, does this make sense? So in the case of the compact boson, I showed you this root with writing the VLAN version of it and then the modified VLAN version of it. And it made sense of it because it was true already on the lattice. So now we're going to do the same thing for this action. So we start with this action with cosines. It had only the momentum symmetry and not the winding symmetry. And we're going to follow exactly the same steps. So first we write it in VLAN form. So instead of the cosine, we write squares. Phi is now real valued. And we introduce gauge fields, but the gauge symmetry is going to be peculiar. It's not an ordinary gauge symmetry, but the gauge transformations act as follows. The gauge group is Z, we refer to it as a tensor gauge theory. Phi is identified with phi plus two pi m. So each phi can separately be shifted by two pi m. And then these n's, this n is on the time-like links, and this n x y are on the spatial plaquettes, on every spatial plaquette labeled by x and y, we have an integer. And just in order to make this action invariant, we will perform this gauge transformation. So this is straightforward uh, on the lattice. We have a separate integer at every point in space time. And these are the transformations we perform. And there is what we can call curvature for this gauge field, which is this combination of derivatives acting on gauge fields. And you can check that it is gauge invariant. And we are going to make it flat by make sending kappa to infinity. So it's exactly the same steps as before. So we have this integer valued tensor gauge field on the lattice, and we deform the action such that we consider only those configurations of the gauge fields which, for which this theory is flat. So we send it to infinity, and now we follow the same steps as before. It might already look like an alphabet soup with a lot of objects here, which is hard to follow, but this is essentially the time derivative of the action. This is standard. It's the same as in the previous models. The plaquette term is delta x delta y phi square, and we make it gauge invariant by adding this gauge field. And we add a Lagrange multiplier on every cube, setting this funny curvature to be zero. Now, whether you like this interpretation or not, this is a well-defined lattice action. We are in the Euclidean space time. We have phi on the sides, we have these integers n on the time-like links and then the spatial plaquettes. And we have a, this Lagrange multiplier field phi tilde. And we can study this. this is a finite problem, finite dimensional integral, finite dimensional sum. And this action or the consequence of this action are very similar to the continuum theory. I'm not going to do it in detail, but it's free, it's quadratic. And it has the two subsystem symmetries I mentioned before. We can shift phi by a function of x plus a function of phi. And we can shift this phi tilde, the Lagrange multiplier, by an arbitrary function of x plus an arbitrary function of phi. So this lattice action has these peculiarities of the continuum action already on the lattice. It has both momentum and winding symmetry. And not an ordinary symmetry, this is subsystem symmetry that acts only in subspace of space and not of all, on all of space. Also, 
we have these integers n tau and n x y, and whenever we have an action quadratic that depends on integers and quadratic in the integers, the first thing we need to do is try to Poisson resum them. If we Poisson resum them, we learn that this action is t dual. It exchanges phi and phi tilde, exchanges beta and beta zero, and exchanges the momentum and winding symmetry. So what do we do with this? So let's first of say, say that all these properties exist now on this lattice model and you can continue. You could say that the lattice model is a much better regularization of the continuum model because it has all the symmetries of the continuum model. And it has all this winding is a momentum and subsystem symmetry and anomaly and duality and so forth. So now that we have this continuum and lattice model, we can start doing computations. And we did computations of two kinds. We can ask more questions about this theory. The first question is what's the spectrum? What is the spectrum, what is the spectrum of this theory? After all, we can consider the system being a, having a Hamiltonian, there's a Hilbert space. What's the spectrum of states? And second, what are the correlation functions? We have operators, so we can compute correlation functions. And we can tune our understanding, but whatever, wherever we do something, we'll do that in the compact boson, in the continuum on the lattice, in this new lattice model, making sure that we're doing it correctly. And then going to this new system and doing the computation, both on the lattice and in the continuum, making sure that we know what we're doing. In the continuum, it's usually easier, but on the lattice, it's more precise because everything is manifestly finite. And if we are going to hit divergences, and I'm telling you, we are going to hit divergences, we'll be able to see exactly where the divergence comes from because we'll have a manifestly finite expression to start with from the lattice. So that's what we did. So we studied them both on the lattice and in the continuum. And I present it here in the continuum, but everything can be done on the lattice. So I'm going to do the spectrum and depending on time, I'll discuss also correlation functions. But as a preliminary, let me remind you first what happens in the standard case, the one plus one dimensional compact mode. So we are talking about many different systems here at the same time, I'm jumping between them. The one plus one dimensional compact boson is a well, well studied systems. Anybody who do quantum field theory learned about it. We presented a new formulation of it on the lattice using this modified delay and has some advantages and we have the continue description, but we're not learning anything new from it. This is just a way of making sure that we, are know, we know what we are doing. The goal of that is to study this other system, which is much more subtle. So let's review the spectrum of the one plus one dimensional compact boson. We denote this, we do that in the continuum. We can do it also on the lattice. We denote the circumference of space by L. And then we just do a Fourier decomposition of phi. So we have modes that oscillate, Fourier modes that oscillate. We have the zero mode of phi, the constant mode. And since phi is circle valued, we can also have phi that is linear in X. And anybody who took string theory 101, <coughs> sorry, encountered this decomposition. So I'll be very brief. These modes come under the name of oscillators and they lead to plane waves. Plane waves because we have a plane wave here of Fourier decomposition. And they lead to energy of order one over the length of the size of the system. These mode, the zero mode, or the constant mode, it's still a function of time. It's like a single rotor. It comes under the name of, it's a, it is charged under the momentum symmetry. The states are charged under the momentum symmetry. And the energy of them is of order one over beta L. Beta is the coefficient here, one over L, the size of the system. And on the dimensional grounds, everything has to be one over L because beta is dimensionless and energy has units of one over L. So every, every energy will have to be of one over L. These states, the winding states, stay that wind around the circle. And they also have energy, which is of order beta times L. Notice that T duality exchanges beta with one over beta and exchanges momentum with Y. Now we could also take the limit as L goes to infinity. So for finite size in the continuum, the spectrum is discrete. We have a nice discrete spectrum. 
that as we take the size to infinity, the whole spectrum collapses down. And the fact that the spectrum collapses leads to the name gapless. We say that this model is gapless. And what this means is that as we take the size to infinity, all the states come down to zero energy. And the energy of all these states scale is one over the length, and therefore they are all equally important. Now let's see how this picture changes when we move to this two plus one dimensional exotic system. So this is the model we would like to study. And we analyzed it in the, so we analyze it with Lorentzian signature. You can do it on the lattice or in the continuum. And I recall this is the system. This is the decomposition that we write. For simplicity, I take the system with periodic boundary conditions in X and in Y. And with equal size of both, we can do something more sophisticated with the boundary condition. And now we follow the same steps. So we ask, this is the field and we write the Fourier decomposition. The Fourier decomposition has all the modes with non-zero frequency, non-zero momentum, Kx and Ky are non-zero integers. And we have these Fourier decompositions with coefficients that depend on time. And we also have all the modes with kx equals zero or ky equals zero, which are here. And we should remember that the zero mode is counted twice. It's mode here, the mode that is independent of x and y. So we start quantizing. We start with these modes. They are plane wave oscillators. It's very similar to what we normally do. But the relation between frequency and momentum is different. Because in the Lagrangian, we had Two der four derivatives in space and two derivatives in time, what we call the dispersion relation or the relation between omega and kx and ky is as follows. So omega square is proportional to kx square ky square. And this has dramatic consequences. First of all, omega scale is one over L square, not as one over L is in the most standard systems. So this states for large L many, many more states come down. They come down a lot faster when the compact boson. They come down as one over L squared. The second thing that is interesting here is that we can have very low omega with arbitrarily large Kx provided Ky is sufficiently small. This is very strange. We can have low energy with very high momentum. Normally, Low energy comes with low momentum. That's why we say low energy, low momentum in relativistic system, momentum and energy are the same. And we have separation between UV and IR. UV is short distances, high energy. IR is long distances, low energies. That's not the case here. Here we can have low energy with short distances or with high momentum. So this is this UV-IR mixing. And this is one reason this model is so interesting. It gets better. We discuss these modes. These are the oscillators. What about these modes? The modes where either Kx or Ky or both are zero. These states are charged under the subsystem symmetry. Subsystem symmetry try to shift these modes for these. So this is just a decomposition. We haven't done anything. And we can think that these modes represent the spontaneous breaking of the symmetry. We'll soon see that this is not the case. I add parenthetically that the standard winding modes that we discussed earlier in the case of the one plus one dimension of compact boson, this is phi linear in X or in Y, are already included in these modes. So we should treat them separately. So what do we do? We take this decomposition, oops, we take this decomposition, we substitute it in the action. We're not, the action decomposes into contribution for this and the contribution for that. We throw away these because we already analyzed them and we are left with this in the action. So what we see here is one plus one dimensional compact boson here in X is for each X and one plus one dimensional compact boson for Y, except that we don't have the D by the X term and the square and the D by the Y square. These terms are absent. So this is the same as the one plus one dimensional field, but without the spatial derivative terms. If we don't have special derivative terms, it means that these phi at x and at separate x's are completely unrelated. They're completely decoupled from each other. So that could be too subtle 
to think about in the continuum. So let's write it in the, in, on the lattice. If we write it on the lattice, X is a bunch of points and Y is a bunch of points. When we go to the lattice, we get a factor of the lattice spacing. And then we can go to the Hamilton. Each phi is circle valued, it's a rotor. And therefore the conjugate momentum is an integer. And this is the Hamiltonian. The spectrum of the Hamiltonian, these are integers, an integer that depends on X. It's definitely discontinuous. On the lattice, different X has different integers. Different Y's have different integer. So we have this N square, some of our integers, and we have one over A. So all the energies of all these modes behave as one over A. This is very strange because it means that by the time we're regularizing, and then we try to go back to the continuum and sending A to zero, the energy of all these modes diverge in the continuum. That's actually good news because it means that we don't have to discuss them. They temporarily appeared in the system, but once we started to try to quantize them, we realized that all their energies are infinite and therefore they do not contribute to our continuum theory. So classically, it looks like the momentum subsystem symmetry was spontaneously broken. And now we see that not only isn't it broken, the symmetry is restored, but in fact, it is infinitely restored. It's restored such that all the charged states are pushed out of the Hilbert space. And the first time we said that, we said that based on the continuum analysis, and this was met with a lot of skepticism. Maybe we were not careful enough with this analysis on the, the continuum. But now that we are armed with this lattice model, we can repeat this whole computation from the beginning on the lattice, never mention the continuum model, and work out the spectrum on the lattice and recover the same answer, giving us confidence in our answers. So we saw that states charged under the momentum symmetry are infinitely heavy. What about the winding symmetry? How do states charge under the winding symmetry? Well, the states have to be periodic in phi, modulo two pi, and a typical configuration that carries charge under the winding symmetry has to look like that, with theta is the heavy side theta function. So this is defined for x and y between zero and L. Don't look at the details because it's going to disappear soon anyway. But this is a function on the torus, and it carries charge under the winding symmetry. This is the current, we take the derivative, we get del derivative with delta function of x and delta function of y. The charges are these line integrals, the charges have delta function. But if we take this configuration and we substitute it into the action to find the energy of such a configuration, that's what we did in the compact boson, we find that the energy of this configuration is infinite in the continuum limit because we get delta of zero. And if we restore the lattice, then everything is manifestly finite we find that all these winding configurations have energy which also scale as one over A. So just as the, all the states charged under the momentum symmetry were pushed out of the Hilbert space, the same is true for all the states charged under the winding symmetry. So let's summarize the spectrum of the system. It has plane waves created by these operators with energy of order one over L square, which is finite in the continuum. There are states charged under the momentum symmetry and the winding symmetry. And their energies diverge in the continuum limit, is one over A. So only the plane waves are present in the continuum. So the main surprise in this result is that the spectrum of the charged state, the states charged under the momentum and winding subsystem symmetries, have high energy, in fact, infinite in the continuum. Limit. These states exist in the Hilbert space of the lattice. So the lattice system has these states. You could ask, are these states really there? Maybe we shouldn't have discussed them from the, from the beginning. Well, on the lattice, they do exist. The lattice system that we discussed, presented has these states. These are states in the Hilbert space, carry charge, and have finite energy. But as we try to take the continuum limit, the plane waves remain, and all the other states disappear. Now, I should emphasize that since these states carry conserved charges, they are also in, so a continuum person would say, why did you bother me with these states? They are not there in the Hilbert space, then I don't want to hear about them. That's wrong. 
That's wrong because these states are the lowest states charged under the symmetry, and therefore they can be added to the system as defects. For people who know, say, the Tory code Hamiltonian and how it's related to Z and gauge theory, in two plus one dimensions, these states are analogous to the charged states in the Tory code. They exist on the lattice, they are dynamical excitations on the lattice, but as we take the continuum limit, the ZN gauge theory does not have any charge state. Instead, we have defects that represent these charges. So that tells us that the study of these states was worthwhile because they are meaningful objects in the continuum, except that they are not part of the Hilbert space. They are part of the Hilbert space with a defect, so they describe the defect in the Hilbert space. So let me make some more comments on the UVIR mixing and present another way of thinking about it, because this is the main point. So we go back to the lattice, and again, for simplicity, we make a lattice a square lattice, and take Lx equals Ly, and we define the total length as the lattice spacing times the number of sites. So these are the formulas we had before. The plane waves have one over L square and there are various mu's and mu zeros there are constant, so I drop them. And the momentum and winding modes have one over the length times A. So we were interested in the limit that we take the lattice system and we take the number of sites to infinity. That's the limit that we are interested in. And we can do that two different ways. One of them is more common in high energy physics way of thinking about things. And the other is more common in the condensed matter way of thinking about it. So a high energy physicist would say, we would like to find the continuum theory. So we take the number of sites to infinity, we take the lattice spacing to zero, holding fixed the total length of the system, right? We make the space finite, finite say two centimeters, five, five miles, whatever. 17 parsecs, but finite. And we have some number of sites in between that were invented in order to regularize everything, but we are interested in the limit that the total number of sites is really infinite and space becomes continuous. So this is the limit that we take. This is the ultraviolet limit, giving us a continuum field theory in finite volume. There's another way of taking the limit, which is more common in condensed matter physics. We hold the lattice spacing fixed, one angstrom. This is the lattice spacing. There is a real lattice. We don't take any limit. And we take the number of sites to infinity. And then what we have is the number, the total length of the system gets bigger and bigger. It's another way of taking the same limit. But notice what happened to the spectrum of the system. If we sent A to zero with fixed little a, the plane waves survive and the momentum and winding states diverge. Their energy goes to infinity. If, however, we take the limit in the opposite order, all these states go to zero energy. These guys go to zero energy faster than these, but all of them go to zero energy. What this means is that taking L to infinity and taking A to zero do not commute. Now, if you're a mathematician, you say two limits don't commute, say, okay, big deal, we are used to that. And there are lots of functions that take the limit two different orders, the two limits don't commute. But for a physicist, this should be completely shocking. We're very happy with limits not commuting. But what we see here is that the UV limit and the IR limits do not commute. The system, the completely regularized system is completely finite. But if we try to take, to remove the UV cutoff, and we try to remove the IR cutoff, Removing these two cutoffs, these two operations don't commute. We don't get the same answer. This is the hallmark of UVIR mixing. When we try to define the continuum field theory in infinite volume, that's ill-defined. We can define the continuum theory with finite volume. This is this limit. We can have infinite volume, but on a lattice. But if we then try to take the other limit, we don't get the same answer. This is the most surprising peculiarity of these systems. For lack of time, I'm going to skip computations of correlation functions. And 
Uh, so I just said that we computed various correlation functions on the lattice in the continuum in these systems. And when we did that, we found again the same thing. We reconfirmed the results about the spectrum and we reconfirmed the result, the fact that the UV and the IR limits do not commute. That in this system, the limit as we form a continuum field theory limit in finite volume and then take the volume to infinity is not the same as first taking the volume to infinity and then making the bodies denser. We also considered many, many other models. So it's one of these things that once we know how things work, and I have fantastic collaborators, we just went through lots and lots of models and analyzed the same thing. Lots of models in the literature and many other models. So this is just kind of a list. The various gap systems that the U1, instead of having a U1 subsystem symmetry, we have a ZN subsystem symmetry. So it turns out that these systems are typically gapped and not gapless. The plane waves do not exist. The analog of the momentum and winding modes exist and they're very interesting. For all these systems with either U1 or ZN subsystem symmetry, we can consider the corresponding gauge theories. And again, we can do it on the lattice or in the continuum and we work out the spectrum, correlation functions, et cetera. And it's always the same peculiarities. And we basically have rules how to work with this. We did it in two plus one dimension and in three plus one dimensions. In three plus one dimensions, there are many more possibilities for the subsystem symmetry. In two plus one dimensional space is, a, is two dimensional. And the subsystem is a line. Could also have a point, but that's not exciting. In three plus one dimensions, the subsystem can be a line that winds around. There could be all sorts of planes or lines. That there's more richness that can exist. And among these models is a special ZN gauge theory in three plus one dimensions that we went through the same procedure. We have a modified BLEN version. We have a continuum version. We worked out the correlation functions, the spectrum, et cetera. And one of them coincides with one of these enigmatic models, this X cube model of VJ Heim Fu, which is one of the most celebrated fractal models. So it's part of the same framework of models. So all these models, have a modified VLAN version and a corresponding continuum description. The continuum description is not standard for many reasons. We have these funny gauge fields with funny indices. We need to think about discontinuous fields, but we can make all these very precise and rigorous by doing it on the lattice, because on the lattice, everything makes sense. <coughs> and that told us how to work in the continuum, and then we would produce the original results. All these models exhibit peculiar UVIR mixing. In fact, the UVIR mixing in the other systems is much richer and much more interesting than in the example I presented today, this two plus one dimensional compact field. And among other things, the ground state degeneracy of the X cube model is given by this formula. So it has a ZN, is the ZN of the gate group. And we have LX, LY, and LZ sites on the lattice. And the total number of ground states depends on how many sites we have for this form. Other models are even more peculiar. So I, over time, let me summarize. The, I started by saying that the low energy limit of a lattice system is expected to be a continuum quantum field theory. This is and has been the common law in physics for decades. And it's dominated a lot, a lot of physics in condensed matter, high energy physics, and even some in some of the applications that were quantum field theory appeared in mathematics, it had in the, we had in the back of our mind this cosmic truth, which now turns out to be not precisely correct. Exotic lattice models are challenging counterexamples to this cosmic truth. They have very peculiarities. Some of them I mentioned today and some of them I didn't. They are characterized by a subsystem global symmetry. The system global symmetry does not act on the whole system, but only on a subspace. They exhibit this UVIR mixing between long distance and short distances. This UVIR mixing is almost the corollary of the existence of the subsystem global symmetry. You can show that once you have the subsystem global symmetry, you almost inevitably have the UVIR mixing. 
And the peculiarities of these systems are really because of this new VIR mix. That the continuum long distance behavior is very sensitive to what happens at short distances. They have a large ground state degeneracy that can be infinite in the continuum. Okay? And if we try to take a continuum limit, we have no choice but discussing discontinuous and even singular observables in the continuum limit. Maybe we shouldn't try and fit it into a continuum field theory, but if we do want to put it there and we do want to reproduce the lattice answers, this is inevitable. And it all, they also have various defects, a very interesting defect. Some of them have restricted mobility. And we presented to some extent in this talk, but also in the whole series of papers we wrote, very peculiar quantum field, continuum quantum field theories that capture all these facts. They involve discontinuous fields that we learn how to deal with them, which field configurations to include. And some of these we can make it very precise by presenting all the peculiarities of continuous of the continuous system. So thank you, stay healthy, and I'll be happy to answer questions. And thank you for all the questions during the talk. Otherwise, I would not have known whether you follow or not. Thank you, Nati. So let's take some questions now. Nati, this is yeah. Tom, Tom Banks. Oh, hi, Tom. Hi, how are you? Yeah, um, for people who don't know, Tom Banks is the person who taught me how to think about continuum and lattice quantum field. Thank you. Um, the, the question I wanted to ask is, do you know examples where these subsystem global symmetries can be emergent? Yes. That is to say, yes? Yeah, so in the example I presented at the beginning, so we, I presented this model of Paramakanti balance and Fisher. This is the lattice action. It has the momentum winding symmetry that you can check it exists. The continuum action is this one. And the continuum action also has the winding subsystem symmetry, not only the momentum subsystem. Very much like in the XY model, the original XY model with the cosine has a momentum symmetry, but does not have the winding symmetry. And the winding symmetry is emergent in the continuum in one phase. And if you then you can dis discuss the continuum system for all values of beta. So in the ordinary XY model, the U1 momentum symmetry is present on, in the standard lattice formulation. It exists on the lattice. And in the continuum, there is a new emergent symmetry. Similarly, here, the higher terms in the cosine are really irrelevant perturbations. That's the same thing is true here. So the so once you're in the continuum and you have this action, the operators that violate subsystem symmetry are irrelevant. In fact, not only are they irrelevant, they are infinitely irrelevant. This corresponds to the fact that all the states charged under the subsystem symmetry have infinite energy. Yeah. So I did a computation of the spectrum where all the states charged under the subsystem symmetry acquire infinite energy in the continuum. And what it means in terms of operators is that the corresponding operators are infinitely irrelevant or using the language of the renormalization rule, all the operators that, that carry subsystem symmetry charge are redundant operators in the continuum, in the continuum description. And redundant is a technical term that I hope at least some of you are familiar with. I'm sure Tom knows that. So yes, the answer is yes. The emergent symmetries can and are often uh, emergent. In the gapped systems, it's even better. The gapped systems have symmetries and they don't have any local operator charged under the symmetry. And therefore in the gapped system, it's, they're clearly a, they are clearly robust under chain, changing of the microscopic system, and therefore all the symmetries can be emerged. I hope it answered your question, Tom. Yes, you did. Thank you. Jeff. Sorry. There's a question from Jeff Scargill, and then Dan Fried will be after him. Jeff. <laughs> 
Yeah, I put it in the chat. Basically, I'm just a bit curious about um, non-uniform lattices, um, uh, causal set theory and, and things like that. It would seem like everything you talked about is based on re on regular lattices, but but maybe maybe I, mi I missed something. The answer is yes. I this shows uh, everything here is flat space with uniform lattices with translation symmetry on the lattice. We studied some examples on FCC lattices. I do not know whether you call them uniform or not. You could have entertained possibilities that the lattices are more crazy or more, gene more general. Uh, we have not done that. We, it was sufficiently subtle here, so we have not done that. I, since you asked about that, the most interesting model in these classes is uh, models that our techniques actually have not yet been, we were not yet successful in addressing. And this is the model known as Haas code. Haas code is formulated on a regular lattice. It's again, a cubic lattice with some interactions. The details are not important. And there is a subsystem symmetry but the subsystem symmetry does not act on lines or planes, but act on a fractal in that lattice. So we have a fractal in the lattice that goes bang, 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 kind of winding around, and it is still a subsystem symmetry. And the peculiarities of these models are much crazier and much more peculiar than any model I described today. The peculiarities there really stem from the underlying fractal structure. The name of fractals here actually originate from the fact that we have fractals in the other uh, in the other model. So this does not address your your question as far as changing the lattice, but the interesting structure that we are interested in on the lattice in this particular in that example is this fractal. So I didn't answer your question, but I answered some other question. Yes, well, and just a, another point is that um, the original um, lattice gauge theory, T.D. Lee's original theory was based on random lattices and has some re really nice properties. And I, I think it might pay off to investigate what um, what, can, what can be done for, for things like that. Yeah, so the, the, the sequence or the way I think of this, the order of complexity or interest is that we start from a rigid flat space, then we can put the system on a curved rigid space, and then we can put it on a fluctuating curved space. And for ordinary systems, this has been done over the years. People study these models. So for example, this XY model that I presented on this flat space, curved space, random fluctuating space, all these problems were discussed. These models, we are still struggling with the models on flat space. And as you saw, it was kind of subtle because of all this UVIR mixing. So personally, I'm reluctant to put this system on a more complicated lattice. I have no doubt, no doubt that the, because of all these peculiarities, this system will exhibit all sorts of new and peculiar things once the lattice will be not legible. It's almost inevitable because of this UVIR mixing. The UVIR mixing tells us that some features at the level of the lattice make their way to the long distance physics. Now, if you're going to make some small change on the lattice here in an ordinary system, it makes no difference. In this system, it might make a huge difference. So therefore, I think this is, would be very interesting, but I'm almost certain it would be much more subtle than anything I've discussed. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dan, please. Yeah, Nati, I'm just curious about this modified Valen formalism on the lattice, whether it's analogous in field theory when you have an abelian gauge field, you could consider simultaneously that field and its dual electromagnetic dual and make a self-dual formulation yes. of that system. And is that what this is analogous to? This is not on the lattice, it's essentially that. Okay. Exactly, not on the lattice. In, in, the, in our paper, we did the same thing for electromagnetism. So we wrote this thing 
the, you know, it's one of these things that when you have one example, it's trivial to work out lots of them. So if you look at electromagnetism, so it's Maxwell theory in three plus one dimension, it has such a formulation that has A and A filled up, both the U1 gauge field and the dual gauge field. And electric magnetic duality is manifest, exchanges there, and the lattice. So it's a completely finite system, finite number of points in space time, finite number of gauge fields, manifest electric magnetic duality on the lattice. This system also has a one form global symmetry, an electric and magnetic one form symmetry. That's true in the continuum, where you shift the gauge field by a flat gauge field, that's the electric symmetry, and you shift the dual gauge field by a flat gauge field, that's the magnetic symmetry. And there is a mixed anomaly between them that you understand better than I do. All these features exist on the lattice. So the lattice model can manifest electric magnetic duality using Poisson resummation. It has the electric symmetry on the lattice, has the magnetic symmetry on the lattice, and it has the atomic anomaly between them. So all the things that you like very much, the two form gauge field and writing the anomaly and all that, all these things exist on the lattice. And yours was the zero form case of that. That's correct, yeah. Okay, thanks. Maybe I could ask a, a very naive question, I think. Um, when, so your, one of your key conclusions was that uh, you have two limits, A goes to zero, L goes to infinity, they don't commute with each other. In algebraic geometry, the, the naive, thing, naive way to interpret that would be to say that you're blowing up the, the intersection of those two, so that your space time inv involves some extra, extra components at infinity. Do you, do you see any, any such structure in your, in your picture? The quick answer is no. The longer answer is that I would love to talk to you about that. And pragmatically, the different ways of taking the limit are answers to different questions. Depending on what questions you want to address, you have to take different limits. And some limits are captured by an almost standard continuity theory, like this one. And the other limit is very singular. So I do not know how to summarize the, the answers in the other limits uh, using the language of the continuum field. And it's clear, the language of the continuum field theory is the right language when you first, the, you first take the UV cutoff to zero, the lattice spacing to zero, holding the physical distance fixed. That's clearly the limit to have a continuum field theory. This gives a continuum filter in finite volumes. The other limits are also interesting, but for other purposes. And the correlation functions are really, I did not present the correlation functions here, but the correlation functions, we, we work them out. So you see, if you have, you're on the lattice, you can write all the correlation functions you're interested in. The action is Gaussian, you can just solve the system. On the lattice, no divergence. And now we can take, look at the answers, and take various limits on the correlation functions. And the limits don't commute, and the formulas are a little bit complicated, but they're very explicit. And the limits don't commute, and sometimes the limits are such that you can summarize the information by such a continuum action. And sometimes they're not. Uh, just because you asked, let me show an example. We can look at correlation functions of two exponentials just to demonstrate what I'm saying. So if we take one limit, the continuum limit, it decays like e to the minus tau over a. And if we take the continuum limit, so a goes to zero, so this exponential, the two-point function of the exponential goes to zero in an exponential way, and that's okay, that's the story I told you. This is the mass, the coefficient here is the mass of the lowest momentum state, and these operators are infinite energy, infinite act, uh, dimension or redundant and so forth. Alternatively, in the other limit, this is actually a computation that was done in the original Parma, Kant, and Dallas, and Fisher. In the other limit, the correlation functions behave like that. It's log log, e to the log square. And this thing cannot be given a field theoretic interpretation. And that's also consistent with the fact that the spectrum in that other limit is, is so crazy. 
Now, is this answer, which of the two answers is right? Well, both answers are right, except that they correspond to two different limits. And for different purposes, you take different limits of the lattice of the lattice problem. Now, I'd be delighted to see any deeper mathematical structure that this is connected to. This is really new. This is unlike anything I've seen in all my 40 years or so of quantum field theory. I've never seen such crazy behavior. And this is with a system that is relatively innocent looking, right? This is, the lattice system is almost standard and the, well, I, I don't want to get into it. The Lagrangian is free. Where was it? Yeah, the Lagrangian is free. So there's really, this looks like a very innocent Lagrangian to study. And it does not look like it's going to be so crazy. And this simple system has a lot of peculiarities in it. And so that's why I'm, I'm really fascinated by this behavior. Anyway, this is what I can say. If you can connect that to anything outside my knowledge, I'll be delighted. No, we can talk about it. So uh, let's see, I, I kind of lost track of the, of the sequence. I think Maxim Kuntsevich was next and then Paul Fendley. And then I had a couple of other people, but maybe they gave up. So Maxim. Okay, yeah, uh, hi Nate. Hi yeah. yeah, yeah, I have just two comments. Uh, if first, uh, at late eighties, I heard about some really crazy random field in two, two dimensions, which is rotational invariant. Uh, invented by some Estonian guy, uh, where, where, where it's kind of random field, it's, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't quantum mechanics, it, uh, there's no reflection sim uh, positivity here, just probabilistic positivity, but random field consists of decomposition of plane and some kind of polygons. Uh, and so we have kind of like this <laughs> discontinuous something. Uh, I, I have no idea what, whether it's kind of could be reasonable limit. Sorry? Can you send me a pointer to... Uh, yeah, I'll try to find it. It's a really long time ago, 35 years ago. <laughs> yeah. And, and, another, and another thing, it's about relation, discrete and continuous um, models. I discovered many years ago some very peculiar fact. You take, for example, Ising model with magnetic field in lattice model, lattice model yeah? So it's not so case. And one can arrange and when I call it inverse to transfer matrix, it turns out to be transfer matrix for the same model with different coupling constant. And someone can make, make kind of uh, appropriate um, reality conditions. So the transfer matrix will be unitary operator. And the same things works in any dimension. In fact, for Ising models, any dimension, complete line is atropic. You have different coupling constants in different directions and some magnetic field. And then you get, uh, in some direction, uh, in one, one of directions, the uh, transfer matrix will be always unitary operator. And I haven't, I, I did try to sell this to physicists many times, but it could be interesting to see any good limit of this. Okay, that, that's it. Thank you for the comment. That, again, if you can send me a pointer. Or... I, I'll, I'll try to send you formulas, yeah, the, for this. If you talk to most physicists, they will tell you these limits obviously commute. Uh, one should not study cases where they do not commute. But now we see that these things arise. They exist and they're not going anywhere. So I think we have to understand them. Yeah. I guess, hi Natty, this is Paul Fenley. Um, yeah, good to see you, I haven't seen you for a while. Oh yeah, likewise. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. It's very clear and very interesting. Um, one, one sort of general comment, usually in the lore of going lattice to continuum, there's an additional condition that people say, which is that you have to be at least in the region or at a critical point so that you can take, you know, the correlation length is very large and field theory makes sense. Um, so you didn't mention this. Is this because, is it possible that in, when you have discontinuous fields, you can relax that condition a bit? Or oh, do you think that's still- This thing actually satisfies, this thing satisfies this condition. 
in fact, the, this theory is gapless. No, no, so these theories, but in general, I mean, some, not all the fracton theories yeah. are gapless, right? I mean, no, some of them are gapless and some of them are gapped. Some of them have fractons, some of them don't have fractons. Yeah. All of them satisfy the requirement that you mentioned. Okay. The, one way of phrasing it is that you look at this, the lattice system and you look at the spectrum. We can phrase it also in terms of operators and correlations, but you look at the spectrum and then you take a limit and the limit is always lattice spacing going to zero. There's this business here of exactly how we take the limit, but in normal systems, lattice spacing goes to zero, size of the system held fixed, size and number of, of centimeters held fixed. So the number of sides goes to infinity, the lattice spacing goes to zero, the product of them is fixed. And sometimes you also need to take the coupling constant on the lattice to a, to a particular point, which is a fixed point at a particular rate. And depending on how you take the limit, you get different answers. And the way to understand it in terms of the spectrum, if you're powerful enough, you solve for the spectrum exactly. You have a formula for the spectrum. And then in different limits, you zoom on part of the spectrum. So always you keep the lowest energy states. And then you take a limit that removes some of the states and keeps the rest. And depending on how you take the limit, you keep more or you keep less. Okay, That's but always, always there's a, so it's, I guess it's saying there's sort of two different correlation lengths depending on how you're how you're taking these limits i see but they're both okay. but yeah, so what happens any... yeah so you look at the system and then you look at the spectrum now in terms of correlation length it's correlations it's the same thing you look at correlation functions of operators and if all the correlation functions behave like power and the rest decay exponentially you throw yeah. away all the exponential, exponential things. yeah yeah if they decay like exponentially, you might, you might be able to do something more sophisticated, keeping those which decay exponentially. But if you all have both things that decay like a power and things that decay exponentially, the rule is to keep those which decay like a power. Yeah. In this language, what we see here is that the plane waves correlation functions of say d tau phi with itself decays almost like a power and the charged operators decay exponentially. Yeah, yeah. The limit that you have to take focuses on the, the plane waves. This is the standard continuum limit. We analyze that, all these different limits in a lot of detail from different perspectives in, in the paper. Okay, good. So, but then some fracton models presumably just don't have a continuum limit. I mean, I mean, do, were there any cases you could prove that just do not have any I sensible? Don't, I don't think so. I, so all the fract. So these are gapless models, and you can look at different gapless models. I present. I decided here to present just one example, which is the simplest. Yeah. We've analyzed lots of them. And they all have some limit that you can take to. Yeah, they all have okay. a limit which makes sense. The most interesting, these are the gapless models. Some of them have fractons. So this model right, right. But big, have fractons, but, but it has some of the peculiarities. Okay. Other models have fractons. Now, the most interesting models are the gapped ones. Yeah. So it's the same as this one, but without the plane waves, because they're gapped. Then there's also a very clear procedure how to take the limit. Look at the lowest energy states and see and take a limit. And then when you take these limits, it's always a trade-off, kind of a, the Goldilocks thing. You take the limit too fast, you have too many <laughs> states and you can't say anything. You take the limit too slowly, uh, you throw away the baby with the data. You have to find the one which is just right. But with the gap systems, it's kind of obvious. You zoom on the zero energy states. You have some zero energy states and the rest. You take the limit such that you zoom on the zero energy states. And that's what you should be studying. Okay. And in all the standard examples that I know of, which lead to gaps on gap list, which the gap is trivial or TQFT or whatever, all these examples, the standard rules I just presented, have work. Yeah. They work so well that you don't have to think about the rules. Here they don't work. So it forces you to think. And sure. in this system, we kind of landed on our feet. We presented how to think 
of this continuum quantum field theory. And we have formulas for the correlation functions and we understand them. The gaps, the gap systems are also, this is also true for them, but they are even more peculiar. See, most of the discussion of making quantum field theory rigorous or most of the discussion in condensed matter physics is, is this relation, this lattice and continuum. So making the physics, the model rigorous is putting it on the lattice, studying it on the lattice and taking the limit. When you do numerical calculations, that's what you do. You put the system on the lattice and you take the limit. And in condensed matter physics, you try to find the low energy behavior of a given lattice system. Most of the discussion in hard condensed matter physics is this. There's a lattice Hamiltonian or lattice system, and you have to ask yourself, what is the long distance behavior? What phase is the system in? That, that's what all these people, this is what all these people do for a living. So these are important questions. And in most cases, in all cases in the literature, except these few, you do the obvious thing and you land on your feet. These systems are more interesting because they're more challenging. Good, thank you. Thank you. We, we can all thank Nati one more time for the lovely talk and, and patiently answering all our questions. Thank you. And stay healthy. Yeah, you too. And we'll, we'll see everybody in a couple oh, of weeks. Yeah, Rupert Caltech. Hi, you all. See. Hi, nice talk. Thank you. Thank you, Hiroshi. Okay, bye-bye.